Hello, Chemistry 11 honors. Um, hopefully you folks had a uh, watch the video on the Lewis dot structures. And so this is part two of uh, Lewis dot structures. And what I want to do is talk about the exceptions to the Lewis dot uh, rules. Now, Lewis dot does give us a good baseline for you know, what structures would look like, but there are lots of exceptions. Okay, and I do want to talk about a few of them. Okay, so the Lewis dot structure is not the end all be all. And I just wanted to talk about some of the uh, exceptions. Okay, so here are the notes. Okay, now one of the exceptions for the Lewis dot structures is something called the odd electron species. And so what you have is you have w at least one unpaired electron somewhere in the structure. Okay and at least one atom lacks a complete set of electrons. Now, example would be nitrogen monoxide. Okay, nitrogen monoxide, what happens is that it has 11 electrons. Or what you have is you have five, five and a half pairs. So how would that work in terms of nitrogen and oxygen having five and a half pairs? So what you would have is your nitrogen with oxygen. So you have one, two, okay. And what you have is you have this unpaired electron. So this is my half pair, okay. And so what you have is you have an unpaired electron. Okay. Now, what's the significance of this unpaired electrons? So the presence of an unpaired electron causes odd electron species to be paramagnetic. It means that it's affected by a magnetic field. If the electrons are all paired, then the molecule is said to be diamagnetic repelled by a magnetic field. Now, in terms of not only do odd electron species have, um, are affected by magnetic fields, you could have some that are perfectly paired up, it looks like, and be also affected by a magnetic field. An example of this would be oxygen, O2. Now, oxygen, what happens is when you drew the Lewis dot structure, you would have something like this. Okay. This is expected. So this one was expected. But what happened is in reality, they're theorizing that oxygen looks like this. So what you have is you have unpaired electrons right here, okay? So these are unpaired. So they're not paired up. So here and here, here and here, okay? Now, and as a result, they are, ex they are affected by a magnetic field. Now, you can watch this YouTube video Okay, and you can basically see what would happen um, with unpaired uh, or how a substance is affected by a magnetic field. Okay, now another exception is expanded octets. In this case, what happens is the central atom is able to have more than eight electrons in the valence shell. The key word here is the central atom, okay? Now, why? Okay, why are sometimes the central atom able to have more than eight electrons? Generally, in the first two rows of the periodic table, the S and P orbitals are the ones that are filled. But in the third row or third period of the periodic table, the D subshell is available for bonding. So what do I mean by this? 
So going back to orbital diagrams, in the third energy level, notice there's 3s, 3p, and also 3d. So because the d orbital is available for bonding, what happens is you're allowed to have an expanded octet. Elements in the second period, if they are the central atom, notice can only have the 2s and the 2p. So here you have a max of eight electrons if central atom. Now, what do I mean by central atom? Is let's say we have PCL5 and SF6. Okay, so if we did PCL5, if I look at my periodic table here, you have P as 5, CL5. So PCL5 what you have is you have 40 electrons. And from the 40 electrons, what you have is you have 20 pairs. So in this case, you would have P in the middle, and then you would have CL all around it. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that chlorine has eight electrons around the outside. Now, you might say, Mr. Cl Mr. Chan, chlorine is also in the third period. So why should it have only eight electrons? Because it is not the central atom. So in this case, for chlorine here is not central, therefore it needs to follow the octet rule. Okay, and in this case, if you look at phosphorus, Phosphorus is able to have more than eight electrons because of the fact that it's the central atom and it's found in the third row. And as a result, it has the 3p, 3d orbitals available for bonding. Okay. Now, incomplete octets, the central atom only. In these molecules, again, the central atom can have an incomplete octet and are considered correct. Now, so let's take a look at boron trifluoride. If we look at boron trifluoride, boron has three, trifluoride is 21, there's 24 electrons. So what you have is you have 12 pairs. Okay, so when you draw it, you have fluorine, boron, fluorine, and fluorine. Okay, so what you have is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, notice boron here is not full. So why is it not full is again, it has to do with uh, boron's electron configuration. So if we look at boron, it looks like this. One, two, three, four, five. So in this case, what happens is it has Oopsie, has, 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 haha. It has less than four valence electrons. Therefore, 
cannot have a full octet. Okay, so because it has less than four valence electrons, it cannot have a full octet. Now, you might say, well, Mr. Chan, what's going on? Why? Well, this is a situation where um, if we were in normal school, I would teach you about something called hybridization, okay? But in, unfortunately, because of what we are in in COVID-19, uh, you would need to read up on hybridization yourself. What's going on when atoms bond together, okay? But just at this point in time, just trust me on this one. Another thing you should be aware of is resonance structure. It's a situation where there's no one structure that adequately represents the molecule. Now, for example, let's say NO3. Now, NO3, it can be represented three ways. It could be O, 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 or N double bond O, 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 or N, O, O, O. And the reason why you can represent it three ways is because the electron in the double bond moves, is moving. Okay? So what happens is in some books, they write it like this, N, O, 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 and they draw a resonance something like this, a dotted line which represents the double bond moving between the atoms, okay? Now, some of you might say, well, Mr. Chan, that doesn't make sense in resonance. Aren't the oxygens all the same? Well, the analogy or example I give you is like your two hands. Now, if you have your two hands, they look exactly the same. You have a thumb and you have your fingers, whatever, but they're not the same because if you have your palm facing the computer screen and you overlap your fingers, you will notice that your thumbs never overlap, okay? They overlap when they're on opposite, but when they're facing the same direction, they're not uh, overlapping, all right? And these are called structural isomers, okay? Or they're called isomers, all right? So just an example for you. Let me continue to share the screen, a few more, and then we'll be it. The last one I wanna talk about is combining capacity. When drawing Lewis dot structures, one needs to remember the combining capacity of the element. Generally, the number of bonds an element forms corresponds to the individual elements combining capacity. Now, for example, let's take a look at carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, a lot of times we draw it like this. O, C, double bond O, like this. Okay, don't worry about the lone pairs. Now, you notice there's two, four, six, eight pairs. The question is, why can't we write it like this? We look at it, we see that there's still eight pairs and all of them, the oxygen, the carbon, and the other oxygen, all have an eight electrons. So why is the carbon dioxide drawn on the left the more accepted structure? Two reasons. Number one is there is symmetry. Okay, it's nicely balanced. You want to have symmetry. Number two, Notice the number of bonds on oxygen is equal to the charge 
on oxygen. Oxygen has a charge of minus two. So what it would prefer is to have a maximum number of bonds of two. Here in this case, there is no symmetry. And also this oxygen here on the right has three bonds. Now, in CHEM 11, this is where I stop, okay? But what, uh, for AP Chem, you need to know something about this thing called formal charge. This is found on page 363 in your textbook, okay? And what this is, is this is related, this formal charge and the idea of formal charge is sort of related to this idea of why CO2 is drawn with two double bonds and not a single and triple bond, okay? So the formal charge, I'm gonna ask you to read through and I'm gonna leave that up to you, all right? I know it's been a pretty heavy lesson uh, with regards to Lewis dot structures, okay? But we're trying to finish things off as uh, quickly as possible before the end of the school year. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and have a good day.